Imagine going for a trip to Mexico. Here you are hiking somewhere and you come upon this. A remote secretive location filled with humongous tanks. Hidden in a valley in the middle of nowhere. I really wonder what most of you would think this actually is. But this right here is actually something absolutely incredible. One of the only such facilities in the world. This is known as High Altitude Water Cherenkov Observatory, also known as HAWK. Observatory whose main purpose is to detect gamma rays. Or to be more specific, it's a cosmic ray observatory. But the question is, how exactly does any of this work? Extremely similar to the famous Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory. In essence, each of these relatively large tanks simply contains water. But the tank also contains very sensitive light detectors that are able to detect what's known as Cherenkov radiation. That same phenomenon responsible for producing unusual glow around various nuclear reactors. With this phenomenon being a result of faster than speed travel inside certain media. Or basically things like for example positrons travel at speeds much higher than what they should be traveling at inside water, they produce this unusual glow. And that's because even though the speed of light in vacuum is a constant, in other media such as water, it's actually much lower than speed of light. Here it's about three-fourths of the speed of light. And so traveling at faster speeds produces this radiation. And this phenomenon is very similar to a typical sonic boom produced in the air when you travel faster than the speed of sound in the air medium. And so once in a while inside of these tanks, when something travels really fast, it produces just a tiny bit of light. And depending on the amount of light, it becomes possible to measure the exact energy of the particle. And by seeing this in different tanks, it becomes possible to determine its place of origin. In essence, making this an extremely accurate observatory for very high energy particles with the energy of about 100 giga electron volts to approximately 50 tera electron volts, or essentially the highest possible particles we've ever seen coming from anywhere. And so when this observatory was built originally, its main purpose was to explore the origin of cosmic rays and to try to figure out where some of these super super highly energetic particles usually come from. For example, it detected quite a lot of these very powerful particles coming from things like pulsars, most famously the Crab Nebula. Suggesting of course that neutron stars are usually able to produce very very powerful cosmic rays. But the most powerful emissions, and actually most emissions, usually come from centers of various galaxies with active galactic nuclei in the center. Over 20 such galaxies have been discovered in just the last few years, confirming them as the major source for very powerful cosmic rays. And so for the most part, in the last few years, this observatory served as a kind of a, I guess, evidence for many different ideas when it comes to the origin of powerful gamma rays that usually form as a result of powerful cosmic rays. This normally happens because as the cosmic ray enters the upper atmosphere of planet Earth, it produces what's known as the air shower, resulting in a lot of different very powerful emissions, with more powerful particles producing more powerful gamma rays. But extremely recently, the observatory discovered something nobody expected. And it basically looks like this. This is literally the image of our own sun visible in those extremely powerful gamma rays. In other words, years and years of detections apparently we're coming from our own sun, and that is something nobody expected. Because not only is our sun not powerful enough to produce gamma rays, we're talking about some of the most powerful gamma rays ever. The ones usually formed in things like supermassive black holes, or when a star collapses becoming a black hole. And that of course was one of many surprises about our sun in just the last few months. So let's discuss what's happening here, how the science has resolved this issue, and talk about other discoveries coming from this beautiful object. And in terms of scientific discoveries, this is the first ever discovery of an extremely powerful gamma ray with the energy of trillion electron volts. 2.6 trillion to be exact. Nothing that powerful has ever been seen coming from the sun. But as you can see from this image, this wasn't just one emission, this actually happened many many times over the past few years. Now it's not as powerful as some of the most powerful emissions. Here this is hundreds if not thousands of times less powerful than a typical neutron star emission. But it still doesn't make sense how the sun is able to do this. There's no mechanism inside the sun that can actually explain any of this. It can produce x-rays, just not gamma rays. And so the first clue to what's happening here actually came from various correlation studies when looking at the solar emissions and the solar activity. For example, we know that normally we detect a lot of very powerful emissions when the sun is at the peak of solar activity. And that's usually because the magnetic fields around the sun become very powerful 
and started releasing a lot of particles with much higher energy. But during six years of observations, there was no correlation between solar activity and detection of these gamma rays. They seem to be completely independent of anything here. Which suggested one thing. Maybe it is not coming from the Sun after all. Maybe the Sun just redirects them from somewhere else. And that's kind of the main explanation here. The explanation here is that maybe once again, the cosmic rays somehow create their own version of the air shower, with some of the particles producing powerful gamma rays that then make it look like this. In other words, this glow is entirely made by the cosmic rays interacting with the upper solar atmosphere. And though it might sound far-fetched, it's really not. Let me show you why. Here is what the Fermi telescope, the famous gamma ray telescope, saw after approximately 128 months of looking at the Moon. This is what the Moon looks like in gamma rays. Now the Moon itself obviously doesn't produce any of this, but the gamma rays are once again the result of cosmic rays. By interacting with the lunar surface, certain particles form gamma rays, with some of them escaping into the outer space. And this right here is the gamma ray image of planet Earth. Notice how it's very different. It basically looks like a circle. And that's because on Earth, gamma rays are mostly produced in the thin layer of atmosphere above the surface, which makes all of this look very different. And so now we believe that this is what's happening here as well. It's not related to the actual sun activity, and instead is related to the interaction between magnetic fields, solar atmosphere, and huge amount of cosmic rays coming from everywhere. Although ironically, the moon is actually still brighter in a gamma ray light compared to the sun, which is actually why it took so long to discover any of this. But the gamma rays coming from the sun are just much, much, much more powerful. Nobody knows exactly how any of this is made. As a matter of fact, the biggest mystery is the fact that it seems to be even brighter when the sun is a little bit calmer, potentially implying that when there is less magnetosphere around the sun, we tend to have more gamma rays, but it's not entirely clear why yet. But it's quite likely that the solar magnetic fields possibly act like a kind of a particle accelerator that turns various cosmic rays into powerful gamma rays. And it does this by slamming them into the surface of the sun, and slamming them with so much power that they basically produce the most powerful gamma rays in the entire solar system, something that we actually believed to be only produced in much more powerful cosmic environments. But that just kind of highlights how little we know about the Sun, even though this is the most studied star ever. For example, not so long ago, for the first time ever, we witnessed this enormous tornado near the North Pole of the Sun. Now this is entirely magnetically driven, but the exact mechanism here is unknown. There was also an intriguing discovery of a new phenomenon visible in certain locations that scientists now refer to as the null point. It seems to be some kind of a reversal of magnetic fields that then results in large emissions right above it and also tends to increase temperatures right above this point, which actually might explain why the solar corona is so extremely hot. It's hundreds of times hotter than the surface of the sun. And so this strange null point, at least to some extent, might be responsible for some of these phenomena that we still don't understand. But there's definitely some kind of a link between the heating of corona, the strength of the magnetic field, and what's known as high-frequency magnetic waves that seem to appear in the outer atmosphere of the Sun. But the question is, is this all connected or are these all separate phenomena? And more importantly, can this actually help us predict what's known as space weather or solar weather? You might remember a story from just over a year ago when SpaceX accidentally lost like 40 satellites because during a relatively large solar emission, it produced an effect on the upper atmosphere of planet Earth where the atmosphere expands just a little bit, but enough to start affecting satellites and in this case, satellites launched by SpaceX. These satellites were now flying through atmosphere that was not there before. And because they were no longer in outer space, the air friction caused them to lose speed and thus re-enter the planet. Which, at least for SpaceX, was a pretty big wake-up call. They now had to also account for space weather and solar activity. Something that we're still worrying about, but something we still don't understand. For example, does space climate exist? Can the space weather change for a long period of time for one reason or another. And though solar activity and solar emissions may not have mattered to us before, they definitely do now. Especially if we start using space more often and if we also start launching crewed missions to locations like Mars. Several observatories by NASA and ESA for the first time ever were able to detect the same solar emission from three separate locations – Earth, Mars and the Moon. 
which intriguingly allow them to calculate the total energy received and even calculate the approximate radiation a typical astronaut would receive on the surface of those objects if they found themselves standing right on the surface. And once again, this highlights how important the atmosphere and the magnetosphere of planet Earth are. And intriguingly, it's the Moon that received the highest radiation. Because the Moon lacks magnetosphere, it basically received everything from the Sun. Total energy was about three times higher than somewhere in the orbit of planet Earth, specifically 31 milligray. Whereas on the surface it was about half, but still much higher than near planet Earth. And so it's actually the lunar astronauts that are going to be in most danger. Staying here for a long period of time might not be very healthy. In contrast, the orbiter on Mars received very similar radiation to the orbiter around planet Earth, but intriguingly, on the surface, the levels were about 30 times lower. And that's because Mars does have a bit of an atmosphere that tends to absorb most of the radiation. And so in that sense, being a Martian astronaut is maybe a little bit safer. In case you're wondering to what this dose mean in terms of the actual health, the amount around planet Earth, which is 10 mg, is sort of equivalent to a typical CT scan, which is usually about 100 times stronger than a typical chest X-ray, which is also equivalent to about 2 years of natural radiation right here on the surface of the planet. So definitely not too much, and it's not going to kill anyone, but if you keep getting these over and over for many many months, it does add up pretty quickly. But we'll actually be discussing these topics in a different video about space exploration that's going to be coming out sometime soon. The main point for this video was that, when it comes to the solar activity, scientists keep finding new things all the time, but there's not always a very good explanation. Which of course means that it's probably going to take years to explain exactly what's happening here, how any of this forms, and where all these gamma rays are coming from. And so at least for now, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. On that note, thank you for watching, check out the previous video that goes through even more different discoveries in the last year or so, maybe subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.